We're gonna have a good time today. CBS CEO Leslie Moonves is a seeming iconoclast in the network TV business. While many on Wall Street worry the internet is threatening CBS's core network TV business, Moonves insists he's winning. During his four years as CEO, the 60-year-old Moonves has invested heavily in more expensive primetime TV dramas like the crime TV series CSI, which is one of the most spectacular financial successes in TV history. We didn't expect CSI to be the monster hit that it turned out to be. CSI and its spin-offs are one reason CBS's viewership rose last year while falling at rivals. CBS remains America's most watched TV network, one reason why CBS shares have dramatically outperformed the market this year. Yet Moonves still faces enormous skepticism from investors on Wall Street. CBS is more dependent than any other big media company on advertising revenue amid doubts that ad sales will ever reach their old highs. The company's shares are still drastically down from their historic highs, as some investors worry whether CBS's network TV model can survive. I sat down with the network chief in Los Angeles for For the Record. You want drama? We got CEO Leslie Moonves on the set of CSI New York, the most successful uh, program ever for CBS and among the most successful ever on television. Uh, Leslie Moonves now pays for all this stuff. Now, in his four years as CEO, he has dramatically increased investment in programming. One reason uh, the company's viewership is the highest in the six of the past seven years among all networks. He's also expanded into the internet and also into filmmaking. They are the number one big media stock in terms of performance thus far. The S&P year up 53, 54% triple the pace of the S&P 500. Leslie, welcome. Thanks, Greg. Good to be with you. First of all, congratulations on your rash of uh, Emmy Awards, either eight or nine. Uh, I've lost so, count. Something like that. It was a good night. It was a good night for television. Let's talk about this. Uh, one of your new programs is NCIS Los Angeles, uh, co-starring right. uh, LL Cool J, uh, right. the rapper. Uh, uh, by the way, I know that you've done a number of cameos uh, right. over the past few right. years. Are we going to see you hanging out with LL Cool J sometime? Uh, I, love cameo the next? I, I love hanging out. He's the coolest guy in America, and it's good for my image to hang out with someone like that. And you said, by the way, the initial pilot you did with him, I think another program was terrible, but he was great, and you decided to take him. Talk no, about that. No, that's exactly right. When you're dealing with talent, you obviously have a, a body of experience with them. LL Cool J was somebody we had to deal with. We put him in a pilot. The pilot turned out to be mediocre, but he was sensational. We almost put the show on, despite it being a bad pilot, just to have him on the air. We kept him under contract, and when we talked about doing a spin-off of NCIS, we said, how about taking this terrific guy and putting him there, and there we are. And many analysts say that a major challenge of viewers is to attract uh, younger viewers in the 18 to 49 category. They've got too many viewers age 16 over. Does, does NCIS uh, Los Angeles help you do that? Well, there's no question. As you mentioned, six of the last seven years, we've been number one in total viewers. We're number two in 18 to 49 outside of Fox with obviously the American Idol, you know, dynasty that's going on over there. But um, we have been getting younger over the last number of years. And a guy like LL Cool J will only continue to help us get younger. Let's talk about another show. It's called Accidentally on Purpose. It's yes. got an unusual plot about a, a woman who had a one night stand with a younger man. She gets pregnant. She decides to have the baby and the younger man decides to hang out to help her raise the kid, but he also hangs out with his younger guys. Right. Now this sounds like it's for a much younger audience. If I was an older CBS viewer or a Republican, I'd be writing a lot of letters to Les Moonves. Well, number one, it fits in with our Monday night schedule with shows like How I Met Your Mother and Two and a Half Men and Big Bang Theory. So we have three quarters of the, of the pie of the number one night in television in comedy. So we think accidentally on purpose can fit absolutely there, and we welcome Republicans and Democrats to watch. How is your audience mix going to change? Talk about 18 to 49, a coveted area, okay? And then, uh, and then uh, the over 60 crowd. How big is the mix going to change, let's say, five years from now, 18 to 49? We think 18 to 49, just taken all by itself, is overrated. We are the big tent network. We like 18-year-olds. We like 65-year-olds. We sell to all of them. That sounds Six, very democratic. The big 60 tent Minutes is a big, big hit. Last year, in its 42nd year, it finished in the top 15 shows in America. Its average age is over 60. We make a nice profit on that show, selling to different advertisers. So anybody who says 18 to 49 is the only thing that matters is not right. Now, I know you'd like to welcome some uh, viewers from, uh, and advertisers from, from uh, Jay Leno or from that slot. And when Jay Leno comes on, uh, he's already come on and has his comedy hour. 
what kind of an opportunity does that provide for you? Because it's going to cost uh, Leno a lot in terms of programming uh, to produce that show, uh, but also it will free up advertisers and potential viewers. Look, NBC CBS. went a very different way at 10 o'clock. They went for lower cost programming with Jay Leno, a big talent, to go at 10 o'clock five nights a week. We have had dramas on at 10 o'clock. Uh, we've done extraordinarily well. I think last year we won four out of the five 10 o'clock time slots, which we think are really important to us. We get additional revenue from those shows in syndication, et cetera. They also are good lead-ins for our local news. So NBC decided to go a different way. We think we have great opportunity at 10 o'clock to get our dramas more viewing. Okay, so you know, basically you got, you got the low-cost reality TV shows, you got the low-cost uh, comedy shows coming on now with Jay Leno. You're the very, very expensive dramas. You think the dramas are going to win this battle, huh? Well, all I can tell you is the CSI franchise, those three, three CSI shows, have brought us over $2 billion worth of revenue. So they're, yes, they're big bets, but they have paid off big time. Same, same thing with the NCIS. People say the shows are expensive, but you spend money, you make more money. Hey, uh, Leslie, uh, we're going to take a break uh, and uh, got to pay the bills, uh, you know, with ad advertisements. So I'm sure you understand that. Go for it. That's right. Uh, we got Leslie Moonves, the uh, CEO of uh, CBS, uh, talking about uh, the outlook for his new uh, uh, full uh, program, also about the outlook for uh, viewership. Uh, uh, next break, uh, he's going to talk about acquisitions, the outlook for a share price, about CNET, that internet acquisition, which some people have been talking about on Wall Street. Don't go away. I'm here uh, with you know, Leslie Moonves on the set of CSI New York. You know, all this aimed, or a lot of it aimed, at getting advertising about 70% uh, of your revenues at uh, CBS, or roughly around that. 65. Okay, 65%. Okay, we'll take 65%, two-thirds. You are trying to boost auto, uh, financial, real estate, and other ads right now as the economy recovers. Are all these sectors going to come back? Well, you know what, we've seen some very encouraging signs from the automobile sector. In our local businesses, which is TV stations and radio stations, automotive is extremely important, probably the number one sector. So when you see General Motors getting back in a big way, which they've announced. Toyota too. Toyota as well. That's great news for us. We are so excited by these programs that these companies have to make a comeback, and uh, we think it'll affect the entire CBS Corporation in an extremely positive way. Now, are these one-time gains, or do you think this is sustainable? Do you think auto ads are going to come back completely? A lot of people say classified, auto, real estate, which has gone to the Internet, it ain't coming back. No, we, we disagree with that. We think when you see a General Motors trying to reinvent themselves, spending the kind of money that they're spending now, which we think is terrific, and they're reestablishing their brands, and we think the automobile sector is going to come back in spades. And frankly, frankly, one of the reasons we're excited about the future and one of the reasons we think our stock has performed so well is because we're tied to an increase in advertising. And when you see what's happening with some of these major brands, we're viewing it as a very positive sign for us. Let's talk about your fourth quarter strategy. We're not talking about football, but you sold about 65% of your total space in the so-called upfront market in which right. advertisers buy big blocks for the kind right. of long term uh, for the next season. Correct. And you're going to try to sell about 35% uh, in the so-called scatter or short term market in the third and fourth quarter. Right. A lot of people are concerned that, you know, when you did that in the last recession, it worked. You were the only guys in town doing it. But now everybody's doing it. Aren't we going to see just excess capacity and prices are just going to get hammered? That would be one theory. But when you look at the third quarter scatter marketplace, there is a huge demand for our product. So our third quarter year to year is up about 30% from a year ago. So the idea that we sold less inventory in the upfront marketplace actually looks very good for us because we think like we've done in the past, the shows are going to be rated very well and there's going to be a great deal of demand during the year for our advertising and we think it'll be absolutely a net positive. It is very similar to the 01, 02 season where a similar thing happened where we held back inventory and during the scatter the pricing was higher we think that's going to happen this year, and it's going to end up being very beneficial. So you think this will also hold up into the uh, fourth quarter or even into the first quarter, this scatter strength? Absolutely right. Absolutely right. What, forces, uh, what if the economy pulls back? The economy pulls back. Uh, well, you have financial problems. Won't that pull back as well? You know what? We're not seeing that. We're seeing in every single one of the categories, their pacing is improving. So despite what may be some signs out there, we are seeing an improvement in our key categories. And we're very optimistic that the fourth quarter and the first quarter scatter is going to be higher than the upfront numbers. 
there are a lot of uh, big reports and studies, including Jack Myers of the Jack Myers Report, and they argue that advertising just is not going to recover over the next five years uh, to its old highs. For example, he's forecasting that network broadcasting advertising revenues are going to fall by about $4 billion, or about 20% between 2007 and 2010. And then when you look at it across syndication local and then uh, a broadcast network, it's going to fall even more dramatically. What are your thoughts on that? Could that could they be right? I mean, it's, it's a lot of studies. You know, there are a lot of studies. I've also seen studies that refute that. You know, Jack Myers is great. He hasn't been right all the time. We are seeing trends in all of our businesses from six months ago that show improvements in every single sector. It's not premature to say the worst is over, but it, it's, it's premature to say, oh, gee, it's never coming back. We're seeing improving trends across the board. That's all I can tell you right now, and we're encouraged. But you're still in a declining phase. It's fair to say that advertising revenues at CBS will still likely be down this year. And, uh, they're and down this year, year, but they're a lot better than they were. Our third quarter is better than our second quarter. Our second quarter is better than our first quarter. And, next and year? our first quarter will be better than our fourth quarter. They'll be down, but, but better? Well, we don't even know if they'll be down in the first quarter. Let's talk about other issues. Uh, you know, uh, news reports have said that uh, Vivendi may sell its 20% stake in NBC uh, Universal, mm -hmm. uh, which might end up spinning off entirely, uh, which makes them vulnerable potentially as a takeover target. Uh, how does this uh, affect you? Does it play to your advantage? Oh, I don't think, I don't think it affects us one iota. Uh, NBC Universal is a terrific company. They have the NBC television network. So whatever Vivendi does doesn't affect us much. How about in terms of uh, a lot of people argue that there could be a lot of assets potentially available for sale, a lot of very prime small cable networks within NBC Universal that a lot of players, including C CBS, might be interested in? I, I would think that N NBC use cable assets are very valuable to them. They've even said that that's more important to them than their network. I don't see them selling them off one at a time and any other company being able to pick off some of the cable assets of, of NBCU. You know what? We're always looking at possibilities to add. We are a content company first and foremost. We like being a content company. If there are any opportunities there, uh, we obviously would look at them, but I don't foresee any major acquisition on our part in the near future. I'm more on uh, the company's strategy where uh, uh, Leslie Moonves is going to get the company's future growth. Uh, don't you go away. Back, I'm here with uh, Leslie Moonves, the CEO of uh, CBS at their Studio City uh, Television uh, Center here in Los Angeles. Uh, Les, I wanted to ask you, because I think you said, although your, your, your primary goal maybe is buybacks and dividends, investing in the company, that if, a, uh, if an attractive cable acquisition came up, it's something that you would look at very carefully. Well, once again, we're not stating what we're going to do with our cash. No, obviously Come on, you, there, can, you can tell us. There are different ways to spend your money. Uh, we're always looking at, gee, what's out there, what's available. We'll look at everything. But as I said, I don't foresee anything in the near future. You know, with uh, Disney doing something with its cash, you know, in the last month, paying $4 billion uh, for Marvel. Marvel. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you see this at the beginning of a wave of more media deals as the economy picks up? Who knows? Marvel is a very interesting content asset, and Disney has, has stated that they're, they're interested in franchise tentpole movies and and that's why the Marvel acquisition made a lot of sense for them. It's going to be a very interesting time right now, you know, as we come out of the recession, to see what happens in the media that, space. Because assets are real cheap now. Uh, you want to buy them, you better buy them now because they're going to be a lot more expensive them, later. Some of them are cheap, some of them are still overpriced, and uh, right now we like the hand that we have. Well, a lot of people say that uh, Disney overpaid for Marvel. I think, you people say, that price I, I think people say that about every acquisition ever made over the course of time. Uh, let's talk about uh, your, your stock price. One thing that strikes me is that Investors have pushed your stock up triple the pace of the S&P 500. That speaks for itself mm -hmm. in terms of their optimism about the future. Right. Two-thirds of the analysts who cover uh, the cover co right. company rate it uh, sell or hold. Uh, there are concerns like you know, revenues, I think, have fallen for a fifth year in a row. Earnings are going to fall 70% this year. They're worried that advertising is yet to recover, that the big media model is outdated. Right. Okay. How do you answer the, this By, by the way, with all due respect, I don't think two-thirds of the major analysts have us on hold or sell. Hold, okay. oh, oh, okay. over, the, over the last six months, I think you've seen a major change in a number of anal analysts going from sell to hold and hold to buy. And frankly, the analysts who said buy at $5 a share are really happy today. And the analysts that said sell or hold at 5 or $6 a share 
are not too happy with their prediction of what would happen to our stock now that we're over $12 a share. Analysts are entitled to their opinion. I think the market has reacted to how our company is performing, to the idea that we are a company, as you said, that is dependent on our advertising. Advertising is getting better. And I think a number of the analysts have changed to a much more positive outlook on the CBS Corporation. I think some of them have, uh, including Laura Martin at Soleil, but I think that actually two-thirds actually still do rank, rank at a seller or, or hold. But you're arguing, obviously, if you look at the stock price, they're wrong. Well, as I said, I dispute the two-thirds if okay. you count the major players. Okay. There, there are a lot of people out there who write blogs. Let's go to another, you just said uh, we were talking about overpriced acquisitions, and you and I uh, know I did want to talk with you about CNET, mm -hmm. uh, an internet acquisition which right. you paid $1.8 billion for uh, uh, last year. I was struck by the fact in the past few months that, that a number of analysts and investors have been highly critical. Jeff Bukas at Time Warner, also uh, Rupert Murdoch at News Corp, also you for very expensive acquisitions. When I talk with Larry Haverty at Gemco Investors, they own mm -hmm. CBS shares. He says, right. you know, Les has a problem explaining why he didn't pay too much for CNET. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I know you feel very different about that. What are these critics missing? Okay, a year and a half ago, the main criticism of CBS is we're an old media company, too much radio, too much television. Any media company in this age needs to be very proactive in the internet, in the interactive space. We could build and wait for years and be behind the curve, or there was an opportunity to acquire what we felt was a growing company called CNET, which is a company that we are very happy we bought. It fits very nicely into who we are. We're now one of the top 10 internet companies in the world right now by this acquisition. We are a player in, in the vertical premium content areas that this company is known for. That's sports, that's news, that's entertainment, that's technology, that's business, that's music. But also you've even gotten money off uh, the NCAA March Madness Tournament. I think you raised $30 million in revenue from that, online that's sales, correct. right? Online March Madness On Demand raised $33 million last year. Found money that dropped right to the bottom line. So we are now a player in the interactive space, and frankly, I wouldn't be, want to be the CEO of a major media company that didn't have a major presence in the internet, and we now do. We're yes. going to come back and talk about uh, the outlook for the CBS uh, Evening News. We're here on Bloomberg Television with Les Moonves. Back here with uh, Leslie Moonves. Les, I want to continue this talk about CNET, your internet acquisition, which right. has been a uh, target of debate. but. I figured that if your goal is to hit about a billion dollars in revenues by 2011, 2012, that would be roughly about 8% of total revenue. So you want to make the internet share a lot bigger, right? No question about it. No question about well, it. I mean, how high well, can you one, get one, it? Of the, one of the desires to acquire CNET, and as we stated, we look to trim down some of our radio and television station assets, is to get into the faster growing area of the internet. And as I said, we are a premium content company, and you need to be a player online as you head to the future. Now, one thing uh, I wanted to look at, uh, you know, key development actually, which made you CEO of a CBS, was the split of CBS from Viacom right. in 2006. Sumner Redstone, who I interviewed about a month before that split, felt that the big Viacom by itself was not performing well in the market. He wanted to split the two up. Right. And I looked at the performance of, uh, of both companies since that split, mm -hmm. and CBS actually is, is the worst performing big media stock since that split. Viacom is way down as well. And it seems like the market has really penalized those two shares since then. In other words, CBS dramatically up year to date, but penalized since then. We got hit by the advertising decline and the depression, and we were 65% advertising based. So as a result of that, our stock went down, and that's how we were affected by that. But we are coming back up. So we were the worst performing for a while. Now we're re re rebounding. One thing I wanted to ask is, well, a key part of your, uh, your strategy, obviously, is uh, primetime programming. You've got Diane Sawyer uh, coming on as anchor of the ABC News World Tonight, yep. uh, where she's facing off, obviously, against Katie Couric. Mm -hmm. uh, CBS still way behind ABC and NBC in, uh, in viewership. Is this an opportunity for you? How do you handle this situation? Diane Sawyer is terrific. We're very pleased with what Katie's doing. We think people respect and honor her as a first-rate anchor person right now. We're pleased with her performance. Yes, she's in third place, but we think the quality of the show is first-rate, and uh, we're very pleased, and who knows what will happen when Diane sits in the chair. You know, you've been a, been a pretty brave man. You, uh, I think, uh, decided to terminate the guiding light 
I think uh, the you know a few uh, earlier this year. Also, I think the Star Trek series earlier. I mean, when you saw that certain programs had reached an age of diminishing return, you had to make a tough decision. At what point do you have to revamp uh, the evening news down the road? Not, ne not necessarily uh, get rid of it, but does it need revamp? Does the evening news 10 years from now have to be, look dramatically different from where, what it is now? Well, Star Trek was canceled six years ago, okay, so okay, okay. That, that's, that's a while. <laughs> that is a while. That's, that's right. a while back. <laughs> but it was a big decision. I, you know, it wasn't but, but, that big a decision it, when you saw the ratings. Okay. But that's but how, okay. how, how, but, but right. how would it change? The, the evening news is doing fine. If mm -hmm. you're going to talk about the one single thing you're most optimistic about over the next year or two for CBS, what is it? I think CBS um, is a great content company. And no matter what happens with the economy, no what happens in the world, content will ultimately win out. Um, and I think that's what we're strong at. As the, as the country rebounds, and I think it is rebounding, advertising is coming back, and it's a very attractive place to be. So content is king, build it, and they will come. That's correct. Leslie Moonvis, I want to thank you very much for taking this half hour with us and also for your hospitality here at Studio City. This interview took place before David Letterman made headlines about an alleged extortion attempt related to his affairs with staffers. Chilly outside my house, chilly inside my house. The publicity boosted ratings over tonight's show rival, Conan O'Brien, and more importantly, several big advertisers are sticking by the show, which no doubt pleases Leslie Moonves. Thank you. For the record, I'm Greg Miles.